The Holy Trinity of DC assembles the remaining heroes to mount a counterattack to Waller's worldwide takeover. But the Fortress of Solitude isn't as safe as they thought. What's the Justice League to do when even their greatest heroes are defeated? Let's find out in our review of Absolute Power number 2 from DC Comics. See you in 3. Welcome back to Comical Opinions. This is our review of Absolute Power number 2. You know, you've got to hand it to Mark Wade. Amanda Waller may have been the worst possible choice to instigate a hostile takeover of Earth's heroes and villains, but the sheer impact of drama and intensity in this issue is undeniable. The central premise is nearly impossible to swallow, but you still have fun reading what's going on. And if nothing else, that's the hallmark of a fun, entertaining comic. Before we dig in, let's recap what happened in issue number one. When last we left Earth's Mightiest Heroes, Amanda Waller's global attack with a squad of Amazo robots robbed nearly all powered individuals of their abilities. Combined with a fake news attack of global proportions to get the public on her side, Waller either captured anyone who posed a threat or sent the remaining heroes fleeing. Those who did avoid capture slowly made their way to the Fortress of Solitude for Sanctuary. So that brings us to the current issue, Absolute Power number two. Amanda Waller takes stock of Task Force 7's progress in capturing every powered individual they can find. They have an 80% success rate, and therefore the team is pleased. But Waller isn't satisfied because she knows that last 20% contains the heaviest of heavy hitters. So she orders her team to prepare for a tactical strike involving Dreamer, Brainiac Queen, and a special project for Oliver Queen. Mark Wade sets the tone of the story with an introduction from the villain's point of view. Superheroes are in bad shape and Waller plans to make their very bad situation very much worse. More importantly, you start to see little cracks in the loyalty of characters surrounding Waller like Failsafe and Dreamer when they notice Waller is incapable of realizing she's the bad guy in this story with the sheer number of hypocritical things that she says and does during the operation. The comic shifts to the Fortress of Solitude. All the heroes realize sitting around isn't going to help anyone, but they bicker over who should lead them to retaliate. When the smartest and most capable let their egos get in the way, causing little infighting, Nightwing steps up as the leader and begins barking orders, in a good way. Batman may not have the top spot this time, but he expresses pride in his quote-unquote son for doing the right thing. Admittedly, Nightwing would not have been my first choice, but this selection is on par with DC's desperation of late to push Nightwing as the best of everyone. Why? Who knows? I don't know. I don't think anybody really knows. Especially with Tom Taylor squandering his chance to elevate the character in the main Nightwing title and the Titans book. Even Wade gets a little bit of a mild dig in when he has one woman lament the foolishness of disbanding the Justice League for just such an emergency and letting the Titans take over, which was a boneheaded play right from jump. Well, if you're going to go with Nightwing, he does as good a job as anyone by getting the heroes moving in strategically useful directions. In short order, Nightwing orders the theft of Waller's mother box, and we'll see that in Batman 151 here coming out the same week. He'll get a call to help from any ally that exists in the multiverse. Not exactly sure who's going to do that, but he puts it out there. Sets up a mission to retrieve Green Arrow to keep his intel away from Waller. He recognizes that Ali is a threat the longer he's with her, so he orders somebody to go snatch him. And then you have a mission to free the prisoners on Gamora Island because they figure safety in numbers. And to top it all off, he gets everybody to suit up and gear up with the weapons and fancy suits that Superman has stashed away in the fortress. Just as a quick aside, yep, Nightwing has every base covered. To Wade's credit, he did more to elevate Nightwing in this issue as a capable leader than the entirety of the Titans and the Nightwing runs combined. The best laid plans of Mice and Men quickly fall apart, but in this case, at least he looks like the leader that he was always meant to be. Suddenly, the entrance to the fortress explodes inward. Brainiac Queen has arrived, according to Waller's orders, with a borgified John Kent leading the charge. So they've got a Kryptonian on their side, and that spells trouble for everybody. Despite everyone's best efforts, the remaining heroes are no match for Waller's forces. They try every trick available. They try using kryptonite on John to weaken him, and that only lasts for so long. They release the miniaturized citizens of Kandor to try and take down the Brainiac Queen from the inside, and that doesn't really work out so well. They try firing every weapon they've got, and nothing works. The issue ends with a big boom, and there's actually two of them, and one is literal and one is figurative. You get casualties on both sides of the conflict, which is maybe a sad moment for some people who are fans of a particular character. I won't spoil it here. And... 
you resolve the issue or at least leave on a cliffhanger that is a queen's gambit and there's a play on words there that is pretty obvious to figure out. Overall, Mark Waid is crafting the only comic that matters in the summer event with an issue that gives you heaps of plot movement. Things are happening all over the place, which is good. Lots and lots of action, which is great. Drama, intensity, twists, turns, thrills. You get it all in this comic. And so if you're going to do a big summer event, this is as pretty much as good as it gets. Let's switch gears a little bit and talk about the art. You know, at some point, you just get sick of repeating how good Dan Moore's art looks on the page. DC is making the smart choice by keeping more around on their roster with upcoming titles because you can practically guarantee that every issue will look great. The characters have that classic look, but they're very detailed, very powerful. The energy and the action and the excitement is all right there. And there's just tons and tons and tons of cool visual interest. Mora is one of the best artists at DC right now. And the longer they can keep a hold of him, the better. So final thoughts, what do we think about Absolute Power number two? It just hits you like a freight train when Amanda Waller's plan for world domination slaps the remaining heroes with even more devastation. Wade's script packs in all kinds of large-scale developments, plenty of drama, and energy that you want from a big summer event. It's got lots and lots of urgency, dire, deep, frantic energy and urgency, and that's what you want. Plus, Dan Moore's art is fantastic. Nothing can really convince readers that Amanda Waller was able to pull off this attack because Wade had tried his best, but he didn't quite make it. But at least the ride along the way is fun as heck, and we're interested to see how it plays out. Therefore, Absolute Power number 2 earns a solid 8 out of 10. This event isn't shaping up to be the best summer event ever, but it's certainly the best DC event we've had in several years. You know, but what do you think? Are you enjoying Absolute Power so far, including the tie-ins? Give us a thumbs up if you are, and leave a comment below with your hopes and dreams for the fallout of Absolute Power and where DC needs to go next, really starting in the October timeframe. Also remember to click on the link in the description to read the written review and buy this comic to help support the channel. That would be much appreciated. So thank you very much for joining, and stay tuned through the outro for more reviews just like this one.